Good morning. In this video, I want to begin uh, the issue, the study of uh, uh, the topic of assurance. And um, at the outset, when we read a, uh, a part of the Chick Tracks, uh, dealing with uh, who is it going to be, but this is the end of it. And this is why people don't have assurance. This is, you're, you're going to see here why reading this, this confusion of what the gospel is that these guys put in there. It's deliberate. So you have a character here, Lord Jesus, I'm dirty and filthy and guilty. I know it. I believe that you, I believe that you died to pay for my sins. Okay. <laughs> now what? Please forgive me and give me a new heart. Well, you already said you, you, you believe that he died for your sins. Why you ask him now to forgive you? You see the, the confusion. Then he's got a thing, they, they have a thing, a check off list. Do you admit that you're a sinner? Yes or no? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Yes or no? Did you ask him to save you? Wait a second. Number two says, is asking you, you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. So why do I need to ask him? What uh, did you ask him to save you and come into your heart? You see how they're mixing, mixing what's true with what's false? You see the confusion that this raises among people. Why they don't have assurance? Because of this nonsense. They can't get their tenses right of salvation. They can't get their tenses right. Once you believe Lord Jesus Christ has, has died for you on the cross and rose again from the dead, was buried and rose again from the dead, and you're putting your faith in him for salvation, you're saved. You don't have to ask. You have, you have to believe. You have to believe. So where's the asking from? Because man wants to put something in. Man wants to put something in to think that that he's done something. And he wants to make it look like it's humble. That's what well, he's asking. Not humble. It's actually a, uh, a blasphemy against God. They're calling God a liar. One, one side of your mouth is saying you believe he, he died for you on the cross for you. The other hand, the other side of your mouth is saying, oh, please save me. Well, which is it? Do you believe he's, he died for you on the cross or not? This is sloppy, stupid, moronic thinking. And this is why there's so much confusion in Christian. This is what you get. And this is why, you know, people defend, defend. Now, this is just checks. I used to give these out many, many years ago because of the, uh, they would have good Bible stories in them. And I'd say, well, you know, the gospel is kind of, uh, squishy and uh, fouled up but now it's they, they've gotten worse and worse and uh, this type of this is the type of thing that attacks this is a sin of prayer type of nonsense and people say well it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because it, it affects people's assurance that's why people don't have assurance of salvation because they don't know well did god say yes and no but you minute, a minute ago you believe you said you believed you believed that he did die for your sins on the cross, but now you're asking him. So now it becomes an issue: well, will God save you or not? No assurance. So when we look at the topic of insurance, assurance of salvation, which right after salvation is the crucial issue, because right after salvation, Satan comes in. If you can't get, if you can't stop an individual from getting saved, he's going to stop him from being assured of his salvation. And that's the next issue that has to come up. But one thing about assurance, it is not the belief in eternal security. In chapter 10, we'll get that eventually, chapter 10, uh, uh, Chafer writes, the, sub the subject of security is somewhat different than the question of assurance already considered. Eternal security is a doctrine of scripture, a divine revelation of an abiding fact which exists whether it is believed or not. 
Assurance is only a personal confidence in, in a present uh, salvation. You have to tell security whether you believe it or not. It's not part of the gospel. What these guys are saying is that if you don't believe you have eternal security, then you can't be really saved. That is not true. Assurance of salvation comes from the fact that once you're saved, you get assurance of salvation, you believe you believe in what, you, uh, what, God, what God has told you to believe in, and then the next verses are starting to deal with the assurance issue, and then you have assurance of, at that moment, you're saved. Where they say, well, hey, you say these the, the people, you receive eternal life. Yeah, and God could take, uh, hypothetically, these, you don't know that God could take that back. The assurance of salvation is the present reality that you're dealing with about you are saved at that moment. Eternal security is the future. Do you have confidence in the future that you can never lose it? And that takes time and more and more scripture to build on to establish that as a fact that you now grasp and understand. But the issue of assurance of salvation is, is the reality that uh, once you're saved at that moment, you know where you're going. You've been saved and you know where you're going at that moment. At that moment in time. So we hear at, from the testimony of the scriptures, a Christian should know that he is saved. There was abundant uh, biblical witness on this point. And it can be hardly be deemed commendable to be in doubt on this vital question. Yet to many, it may seem to be presumptuous in the extreme for one to be assured of his own salvation. And that's, that's the reality. They, they think if you have confidence in the fact that you are going to heaven at that moment, they think it's presumptuous. And uh, that's where religions all built up the whole idea. Of, the denominations have built up the idea that you, know, you can't say that because, you know, uh, you, you know, they reject, now they reject eternal security, they reject the idea that you can lose your salvation and therefore uh, the, uh, uh, the assumption of that, that, you, uh, uh, that you have uh, assurance, they consider presumption because they consider you have to consider, continue to work, to work for your salvation. Where there is a lack of assurance, there's usually an impression that so long that so long as the daily life is quite imperfect, and how immodest it would be to claim that is otherwise, it is unreasonable to do any more than hope that through some special exercise of mercy on God's part, it will not be as bad in the end as it might otherwise be. So the issue is, you know, assurance of salvation is the reality of you know, the day by day walk, and the fact that you are saved. At that moment, you've been saved, and your walk, you have confidence at that in that day that you're saved. Eternal security is the fact that no matter what happens in the future, you will you will remain saved. No matter what happens in the future, what you do, you will, will remain saved. And that takes time to develop the understanding of that and the character of God, the attributes of God of why that has to be truth. Unwittingly, such, such, such attitudes of mind disclose the appalling fact that persons who hold such views have never turned from dependence on their own works. See, this is the guys who tell you, you know, like, if you're doing this, you're going to hell, and you're doing this, you couldn't have been saved in the first place. Either they worship salvation goes one way. If they see you sinning, it means either, uh, either you weren't saved in the first place, or your meaning of, uh, the meaning inside of worship salvation is that uh, you lost your salvation. So they have two routes they can take on this. And the, uh, the uh, bunch of one group of guys, they'll look at the ones, only one side of it, you know, the, the Armenian view. But the Calvinistic view is that uh, they'll, they'll look at it and say, well, if this guy's involved in such and such, such a, a, a activity, he couldn't have been saved. In the first place, or he wouldn't have done those things. Well, that, and then these same guys will claim they believe in eternal security. Well, that's the purpose of eternal security. 
that people can be involved in these activities and still be safe. They'll think, oh, no, no, I believe in town security. But then you're looking at people in their life, the lifestyle, and you're saying, well, that guy can't be saved. Now, agree, the only way we can tell if the person is, is saved is the testimony. But the issue of eternal security is the view that he could be saved. He might not be saved. He probably isn't saved, depending on what we're seeing. But he could be saved, and you don't know it. You don't know it. That's the issue of eternal security. That despite losing your testimony, despite losing uh, the, uh, the fact that people can uh, identify as a Christian because you've now uh, you know, backslid to a point where people can't, they would say, that guy can't be a Christian and be doing that. He's a total, you know, total failure as a Christian. Those who believe in eternal security say, well, that might be true. He isn't, he might not be a Christian. In fact, it, it, it probably is probably true, probably true that he isn't a Christian. But you can't say for sure, definitely sure, that he isn't a Christian. And that's the es essence of eternal security. He goes on to say, uh, if salvation depends on, in any degree on personal goodness, there could not even be a saved person in the world. There's your faith work system out the window. The Old Testament faith works. If salvation depends on any degree of personal goodness, there could not be even a saved person in the world. So why? Because your works can't be saved. So all these people talking about faith and works in the Old Testament and the tribulation are liars. Are liars. Grace is everything God does. You can't do anything. Any dispensation. Any dispensation. Because that's, a, that's an attribute of God. Your works can't come in. Into play as part of the salvation issue. And if you tell, anybody, tell, any teacher is telling you otherwise, he's lying to you. Uh, if salvation depends on any degree on personal goodness, then it could not be even a saved person in the world, and therefore no ground in it for assurance. See, once, once works come in, you, don't, you lose your assurance. Once you start asking God to save you, there's no assurance. When you believe that God has saved you, there's your assurance. Assurance, because you, you, you're trusting what he did do. But once you ask, there's always a possibility of, no, I'm not going to save you. Or why ask? Salvation is not offered to those who have purpose to be good. You see, that's, that's fine dangler. That's exactly what he says. And his, his, his testimony says, I, you know, I want, he wanted to get stopped sinning or something like that. And he says he, he was going to say, I, I'll, I'll do what you need, want me to do. He, he was telling God he purposed to be good. That's exactly what that whole little cadre of group was saying. You have to purpose, tell God, you purpose yourself, I'll be good, God, in order to be saved. That's exactly what he is teaching. And his little followers, and his little group, cult group. Salvation is not offered to those who have purpose to be good or religious, nor is it guaranteed to those who hope God will himself be good and gracious in the end. That's, that's asking God to save you. That's asking God to save you. That guy is hoping that God will be uh, good and gracious. That prayer defeats assurance. It is offered to uh, all meritless, meritless, helpless sinners who are willing to believe that God has already past tense. Past tense. Has already been good in that he provided that he has provided in Christ not only what they need now, but all they need in time and for eternity. That's the reality of it. It's a path issue that you're trusting in and confidence in. This too is believed on no other evidence than that God has said in his word. In looking away from self and one's failure uh, to Christ and the saving grace, one will find 
adequate grounds for a God honoring certainty as to position and destiny in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. No life would ever be good enough to merit anything but condemnation from a holy God if judged on the grounds of moral equity. On the other hand, no sinner has fallen so low or so weak in himself that he cannot find absolute rest and assurance in the sal of his salvation and looking away to Christ and his finished, provision, finished provi provisions of his grace. The attitude one may hold on the question of assurance may thus become somewhat of a test as to whether he has really believed on Christ, although it should not be assumed that such is inevitably the case. So, first thing you got to do is, you know, if you have issues where you're going backward and everything, I say, well, did I really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? That, uh, if you, once that you have an inward testimony of the Holy Spirit, you did, then you got another problem. It's not a salvation issue, it's a walk issue that you're dealing with. And so that's the whole purpose. You can't judge by what you're doing to define what you're, that you're not saved. What you got to do is what you have to read the gospel. You have to judge, in order to judge and say, okay, why have I believed? Have I believed the truth? And once you recognize it, I have believed the truth. I have believed what's necessary to be saved. So then you have the insurance, and now you can sit, now you can you can focus on what the real, uh, what the problem is is is. It's not an issue that you're not a saved person. All the churches want to get you involved in the idea if you're doing such and such thing, you're probably not saved. And that's why we see all these retreads going on in local churches. No, their walk is the problem. Their walk is the problem. Or they had a sinner's prayer issue that led, leads them to doubt because, well, I asked God to save me, you know, and you know, I don't know if he did or not. So... Instead of saying, no, I believe that God, that Jesus Christ died for my sins in the course and rose again from the dead. I believe that. So I have to be saved. I have to be. Oh, God is a liar. That's what she's saying. And that's where the, the Gospel of John, first, particularly 1 John, we'll look at 1 John, is talking about the issue of fellowship and the issue of confidence. Of believing, of knowing what you believe. Facts about assurance. Having put one's trust in Christ in him for salvation, one must either believe him to do what he has said, or in the measure in which one fails to do, suppose him to be untrue. It's either or. You either believe what the word says about the gospel, or you're going to ignore it. You're going to, you're going to deny it. You're going to reject it. And there's where you become unstable. There's where you become unstable. Because you doubt the word. You're supposed to know you're saved. And when you get into a sin state, which might last for quite a long time, which even the worship salvation is by what by the way, except in the Calvinist the Calvinist wing, they accept that. That person go a long period of sinning. But they've been in perseverance of the saints, so God will eventually bring them back to a point of repentance. Uh, the, the true view on that, of course, is not a perseverance of the saints, but once the uh, once saved, always saved, is the idea that an individual can suffer the sin of the dead. He can keep sinning right to, God, right to the point where God will kill him and take him home. Going on, he says, if being note the very day and hour of such a we see, okay, let's see. Uh, at this point, a, a doubt is sometimes expressed as to whether one is really believed in the saving way. As a matter of fact, such a doubt is still one in regard uh, to himself rather than of God. That's when people try to tell, did you really believe? Did you really believe? That's why he went to 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe you had a vain faith. Maybe you had a vain faith. Who says it all the time? Blind down Maybe you had a vain faith. And we, we read that. It's not talking about anybody having a vain faith. In the sense that their faith was the problem. What Paul's talking about First 1 Corinthians 15 is the object of the faith. If Christ wasn't resurrected, your faith, their faith would have been vain. Our faith would have been vain. My faith would have been vain. Your faith would have been vain. Paul's faith would have been vain. Because it didn't happen. So it is the faith that's the problem. It's the object of the faith that's the problem. 
And so when God's coming, well, did you have enough faith? Did you? Maybe you have enough faith. <laughs> no. Did you believe in the right thing to be saved? That's the issue. This, of course, is another, uh, let me see here. This, of course, is another question altogether. But one is so important that nothing else can be undertaken or determined until it is settled. You got to know that the faith, you had the right object of faith. You believed what you needed to believe to get saved. Your faith wasn't the problem. The issue is you got the right object. God led you to the scriptures. You believed the scriptures, and therefore you are saved. And so once you settle that, and you're having a problem in your walk, you have assurance of salvation. Well, I know I'm saved. So what's what's the other problem? What's my problem here? Why am I still sinning? Why am I still dealing with a particular sin? Why am I going backwards? But those are walk issues. Those are sanctification issues. Progressive sanctification issues. That now you can go through the scriptures and look for the answers to. But if you're looking to see whether you're still saved or not, you've got a whole different issue and now you're off track. And you're a saved person looking how to get saved. When you should be looking how to walk the Christian walk. Uh, let's see. This, of course, is another question altogether, but uh, one is important that uh, has been taken a term unto itself. The only cure for this uncertainty is to end it with certainty. These guys are throwing uncertainty at you. You have to end it with certainty. You've got to know that you know. That you believe the true gospel. And these guys with these chick tracks and, you know, and Brian Denley telling you and these other liars telling you that, well, you know, you just maybe your faith, you know, you didn't do enough of this and you didn't do enough telling God that how bad you are and pleading with God and begging with God and that you want God to help you and save you, and, you know, and uh, that's the way you have to come to him, you know, and uh, uh, that's the, you know, the method, you know, you've got to come to God with a certain, certain uh, uh, aspects of emotion that uh, uh, you want to change life, God. You want to stop this and stop this, and then that's relevant to salvation. None of it. Fourth gospel. So, let such a person face his own utter sinfulness and meritless, meritlessness, meritlessness with the revelation of the cross and discover as he must no hope in himself and then and there once and for all appropriate the provisions of divine grace for every need of a sin cursed soul it's all been provided for it's done it's finished you're saved now move on move on don't be shocked by your sin nature that hasn't gone away but the issue is, once you've established the fact that your salvation is certain, it's time to stop. And that's the, the advantage of no internal security, because the whole idea is to stop walking back. Stop questioning your salvation. And recognize that, yeah, you're going to continue sinning. Now the issue is growing in grace and dealing with those sins and your walk. It should be noted that very day and hour of such a decision and believe in this a decision itself enough to thank God for his saving grace and faithfulness. There's a prayer. There's your sinner's prayer, people. The saved sinner's prayer. You're thanking God for saving you. You're not asking him to save you. You're thanking God that he did save you. So all this junk that these people put out, well, the sinner's prayer doesn't hurt because then you get to know exactly when you were saved. Not when you ask God. You want to get a date when you, you, can, you can identify, say, this is the date I was certain I was saved. Was a date you can put down, this is the day I thanked God I was saved. Not asked to be saved, but thanked him that he did, did, did save me. These guys got you all, all over the map with your emotional tripe. 
enough to thank God for saving grace and faithfulness, and in every thought, act, and word thereof to treat the decision as a final and real. As final and real. It's done. It's over. Move on. Stop questioning it. You believe what the scripture said, you're saved. Don't let people care. Well, I, I'm still doing this. I'm still doing that. Well, that, that's just in nature. That's just in nature. No one said you can stop sinning. Well, you don't feel this. You don't feel that. Who said you're going to feel something? <laughs> Feeling is subjective. No one's saying yeah, people don't feel things when they get saved. No one says that. But it's subjective. There's varying degrees of it. Degrees of it. See, it, that's not the that's not the uh, uh, the uh, the standard by which you judge your salvation. Some people are going to feel more when they get saved. Some people might feel less. Some people won't feel anything at the moment. But they they are they will have acknowledgement that they are saved. And then there'll be inner witness of the Holy Spirit that they are saved. And then the idea is that you'll have a spiritual desire for things that won't exist in the un unregenerate man. You'll have a desire to hear spiritual things. But this comes with more and more growth. This comes with more and more growth and this comes with more positive volition. And you want to hear more of the word of God. You want to hear uh, 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 the uh, more uh, understanding of Christ Christian walk and the Christian life. And what God has for you planned and these things. And you, these are things that only can come from the Holy Spirit. Because I'm a general man doesn't care about any of that stuff. Spiritual songs, psalms, rejoicing in the Lord, a desire for the scriptures. All these are spiritual aspects that the unregenerate man has no, no concern about. It is a crying eater of a multitude of religious people that they bring themselves to some final dealing with the Son of God with regard to their sins and his salvation. That's what water baptism is about, people. That's why it's an ordinance. It gives a finality to the fact that you give a testimony, a witness to the reality, to the world, says, I believe this. And you're separating from the world. You're separating from the world and making the acknowledgement. I'm not of the world anymore. I'm of Christ. I'm a Christian. I don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the water baptism is a, a legitimate ordinance uh, to identify, to give that witness, that testimony. But again, the, the person isn't saved because of the water. The person is saved because of what he believed, and the water is a testimony of that, of that, of that salvation. They should be positive enough in, enough in this matter to face the eternal question before him as to whether they choose to stand in his grace alone or in something within themselves, even the slightest degree. Get that. They should be positive enough in this matter to face the eternal question before him as to whether, him is capitalized God, as to whether they choose to stand in his grace, you can believe the word or not. I said, I got clear. You, you, think, you, you think you sinned, you're such a bad sinner, God can't save you. God didn't die on the cross for your sins. I said, well, I, I just don't, people, I don't think he died for me. Well, you'll call him God a liar. God is very clear. He, Jesus Christ died for all men. On the cross. Everyone. Without exception. So when you say something like that. You're a liar. You're calling God a liar. They should pause enough in this matter. To face the eternal question before him. As to whether they choose. Free will. There's your free will people. You choose this. You choose to stay in the faith. Or become a heretic. And a liar and a deceiver, like many false teachers out there, who are adding to works because they want to say, oh, it can't be that simple. It can't be that easy. It can't be that fine now. Final, or, 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 or finality. It can't be that. It, can't, it has to be something added to it. 
and then they'll put a burden on you because they'll stop certain certain particular sins that they want to get stopped like you know let's say smoking or drinking or whatever and then they'll say well you, you can't be doing that and still be saved if you're really saved, you ask God to ask you, you know, like you, like I did, and stop smoking, and stop drinking, and stop this, cursing, and stop this, and stop that, and stop that. You know, they have their little list where they think they're perfect because they stop this and stop that and stop that. Now, should a person stop? Yes. But the fact of the matter is, is everyone comes to God with a different set of issues. And what my strengths may be, my strengths might be your weaknesses, and your and your strengths might be my weaknesses. So stand His grace alone, or again to choose to choose to stand His grace alone, or in something within themselves, even in the slightest degree. This is the eleven issue, eleven. When people, oh, oh, and he's just, he's almost perfect, he's almost, oh, 11, 11, 11, it kills the salvation gospel, it kills it. Oh, he's, uh, you know, oh, well, uh, and everything else, he's okay. He's leavening the gospel, it makes it another gospel, even in the slightest degree. This is a false gospel. Chick tracks are a false gospel. The sinner's prayer is a false gospel. Making confession part of salvation. Romans 10, 9, 10. Is, is a false gospel. What a baptism. But making baptism part of the gospel is a false gospel. Making eternal security part of the gospel is a false gospel. That's when people have a big problem with me on that that issue. But eternal assurance and eternal security are different things. Eternal security is a doctrine. Assurance of salvation is a certainty of that moment you're going to heaven. Eternal security is the confidence that that can never change. So it doesn't take much. Gospel is simple, but it does take much to love in it. Corsos gospel. Let's go to John. And let's ignore the blood. The blood atonement. Let's ignore the fact that people have to be convicted, convinced of their sin. Let's take things in isolation, out of context. Let's go, let's do that. And still still call it and still still say it's the message. They'll say, oh well, yeah, the gospel is a doctrinal issue, but you can be saved with the message. Of the crossless gospel of John three sixteen, for instance, they'll say, "Well, that one verse can save you." No, you can't. No, it can't. It's just telling you a fact of what motivated God to save you. But you got to believe in His death, burial, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. What say people do is that they import their own understanding of the gospel that unbelievers don't understand yet. And that is a danger. You come in there with a preconceived, you, you have understanding of things that people don't have, an, uh, uh, the army general man doesn't understand yet. And you're already assuming that, you're, you're putting that by in, uh, uh, the uh, uh, intuitive aspect that just, well, certainly he would know that. No, he wouldn't. It's a spiritual phenomenon. It's a spiritual issue. They don't know anything about that, about Jesus Christ dying for them on the cross. It's a spiritual that's, that's revealed by the Holy Spirit. It says, no very deep, deep conviction of assurance can grow in any heart where the mind is still wondering whether it has really believed in a saving way. There's your, there's your 1 Corinthians 15, where they bring up the vain faith. Maybe you had a vain faith. Read the entire cha uh, passage, chapter, of 1 Corinthians 15. And see, it has nothing to do about the faith being the issue. It's the issue of the object of the faith. But they'll co constantly use that. See, a vain faith. You got the vain faith. Maybe you have enough faith. Maybe your faith was too weak. 
and is really believed in a fit, same way, and there's no impression of certainty allowed to take root, and no, and no impressions of certainty are allowed to take place. To take root. So what happens right after the person is saved? You bring them into a Sean's verses, which is John. This is what you do. You bring them into the passages that say, now you have, you have confidence that you've, you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. And these things are written that you may know, that you may know, not doubt, know that you are saved. Confidence and faithfulness of God will not thrive where one is constantly singing hymns which have been written to voice the position of the unsaved, such as the hymn which one is assuming to be, to be uh, coming to the cross. Let that issue be sealed and passed. So far as salvation is concerned, and rather let one be occupied with those blessings which are vouchsafed about saved to those who, who have believed it would be much more reasonable to sing in, sing in the cross of glory of Christ I glory in a lot of churches a lot of churches constantly uh, sing gospel songs dealing with people who need to get saved as opposed to uh, songs that are, 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 are glorify God for being saved and so that's what you have a problem local churches Confidence in Christ. He says here, the word of scripture becomes the title, deed, or official write writings as to the certainty of the transaction. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye, ye have eternal life. Such wonderful knowledge, therefore, is to be gained through the things, gained through the things written. The written things are as exceeding great and precious promises but these promises can be no avail to the heart that will not believe him or take him at his word normal christian experience and the joy and peace that results from believing can never uh, even begin in the heart until god has been trusted to the extent that the record of his saving grace has been believed and received so the problem has never been the issue a lot of people might not be saved you get assurance of salvation because of this nonsense that people are always adding something to the gospel. Because they've added something to the gospel. And so they don't not believe in my faith alone. They've added something there. They've gone to Romans uh, uh, 10, uh, 10, uh, Romans 10, 9, 10. And they've gone to Romans 10, 13. Whosoever call, shall call upon the Lord, name of the Lord shall be saved. So you gotta say a prayer. You gotta say you gotta call upon the name. Is anything about the gospel there? Excuse me. It's not part of the gospel. We should go call upon the name. It says who about believing on the name. The calling is a prayer. That's what saved people do. That's what saved people go to first Corinthians. Uh so first Corinthians one three. Yeah, point one two. First Corinthians one two. Unto the church of God, which is in corner, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Let's say people. I don't let lost people. And of course, the Corinthians were all kinds of had all kinds of fellowship issues, but they were saved. There, uh, there is a normal Christian experience. There are new and blessed emotions and desires. Old things do pass away. And behold, all things do become new. But all such experiences are but secondary evidence as to the fact of salvation and that they grow out of a positive repose of faith, which is, in the, primary, which is the primary evidence. There is very much scripture about the results that are sure to appear in a, tra appear in a transformed life. True salvation must result in such realities. No one's denying that. No one's denying. They say, well, you have to have a, a changed life. A changed life. You're going to have changed desires. You're going to have a changed 
uh, aspect of you that the Holy Spirit now is in you, try, moving you, uh, uh, encouraging you to move in a direction. But you are still, you still have free will. And so this is only that's only a secondary issue of whether you produce that or not. It's not a primary issue. It's a secondary issue because you can say no, still say no to the Holy Spirit. It isn't automatic. That's what these guys want you to believe. The Holy Spirit does come into you and fills you after it was immediately saved. You fill those people, in, and of course, you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ, and you have uh, all the things we talked about, the inheritance things. The Holy Spirit's now moving. Now he's trying to, he's trying to get you oriented as a babe in Christ, which, you know, we do, we'll talk about that chapter, talks about babe in Christ as being carnal, but a babe in Christ goes to be a beginning Christian as well, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, a mature Christian. So you're, you're beginning your walk. And now the issue is now you, you're being attacked in, from three parts of the world, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, as a Christian. God, Satan doesn't care about unbelievers. He's got them. He's got them. They're his. He only cares for making sure they stay blind. But once you get the you get the light and you see the light and you and you believe in what the gospel you believe in the gospel and you're saved, now that intensity increases and you 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 actually thrust into a war setting. And what happens now? Now you're trained. You enlisted. <laughs> you enlisted. Now you start your training. You weren't drafted. You weren't drafted. You enlisted. And so now you, you enter into the warfare. But you've got to be trained. And so this is the issue now where your walk now takes, takes an issue. And you, the inner man does have a desire. To have spiritual things. Because the unregenerate man has no concept of having, uh, it's all flesh for the unregenerate man. That's why it's very hard being a Christian. They think it's easy. Not hard being, it's, it's, it's hard because the reality is you still have the desires of the flesh, but now you have a new set of desires. You have two set of desires fighting each other. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 7. And people want to try to think, oh, that's Paul, that's Paul before he got saved. No, that's Paul after he got saved. And he said, I got two, desi he got two desires going on here. And that's from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's given that desire to walk the way God wants him to walk. And then he's got his flesh saying, no, I'll go back to the old life. And the new believer has to understand that. He thinks once he gets saved, he says, well, you know, everything's, everything's wonderful now. You know, it is wonderful in the sense you're going to heaven. That is wonderful. But now you begin your walk and you say, man, I felt under a lot of pressure. The pressure is there only one reason. Because you have a new set of desires that are fighting another set of desires. The unbeliever doesn't have that. He might be dealing with a particular issue of desires that are affecting his immediate life of sin that he's involved in, cleaning up his life, cleaning up his act in order to live a more moral life, in order to live a better life. But Christians don't become Christians. You don't become a Christian to live a better life. You become a Christian in order to get to heaven. And Brian Denning is trying to say, well, I have this problem here. I was involved in this. I want to have a better life. You don't become a Christian to get a better life on earth. You become, become a Christian in order to get to heaven and have a better eternal life. That's the issue of the gospel, eternity. Now, the issue of, of how you're going to live on in time, that's a whole secondary issue. And Christians all of a sudden find themselves with a whole different set of problems that they weren't expecting. And because pastors aren't warning them, but they walk about what's going to go on. You're in a warfare now. That's what Ephesians 6 is all talking about. It's a war. 
You got to be prepared. You got to be trained. You can't send untrained people into war. They don't last very long. They don't last very long. Take, and it takes quite a long time to train up a guy for warfare. It takes years. It takes years to prepare a person where he's ready for severe combat, intense combat. And that's why as you grow, the Lord will send more tests to you, more tests to you, more tests to you. And maturity growth is the point where you, you, you're into the real heavy uh, warfare, dealing with uh, things to glorify God, like Job. Uh, it is inconceivable that a Christ should come to live in the human heart and, and, ex and, and his experiences remain un unchanged. There must be under such conditions a new and vital relationship to God the Father, to fellow Christians, and to Christ himself, a new attitude toward prayer, toward the word, toward sin, and toward the unsaved. That's all going to be there. No one's denying that. But it can be suppressed. It can be, it can be, it can be uh, grieved. It can, the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. So those desires pop up and you fight against them. You fight against yourself. You fight against God. But they're there. But whether or not you're going to follow those desires or follow the desires of the flesh is up to you. Now, the person from the outside can't tell you, can't say, well, you must not have those desires. Well, he doesn't know if you have the desires or not. Well, that person will say, if you have a changed heart, he'll have a changed life. Well, he, you don't know if he has a desire for a changed life in order to live a, script, a, a, a spiritual life or not. And that he's just suppressing it. He's just fighting against it. Like Demas loved the world and left, you know, left, left Paul. You don't know from the outside what the, the inner battles are going on with that individual. If in fact he's saved. There must be under such conditions a new and vital relationship to God the Father, to fellow Christians, to Christ himself, a new attitude toward prayer, the word, toward sin, and toward the unsaved. This is the viewpoint of the Apostle James when he contends so earnestly for works that will justify. It must be remembered, however, that James is not is here concerned with the appearance of our professions made, made, uh, made to the outside world rather than our acceptance before God. James 2. Is Chafer. He's not talking about Abraham getting saved in James 2. He's talking about Abraham showing he's saved in James 2. Anybody tells you that Abraham got saved in James 2 is a liar. Gene Kim, Robert Breaker, Andrew Sluter. Time for Truth. They're liars. Abraham was saved in Genesis 15 by faith alone. That's what Paul is saying in Romans 4. James and Paul are not contradicting themselves. The justification that James had, that uh, was uh, spoken about Abraham in Genesis 22 was a maturity test that he passed, as it said instead in Hebrews 11, that showed his maturity. But these faith work guys in the Old Testament attack grace and tell you, oh no, he was saved. He had to show. He had to do something. He had to work. And they lie. But you think they're great teachers. <laughs> okay? Keep going with the lie. Uh, men can judge only. Men can judge only by the outward appearance. And works alone can justify the Christian profession in their sight. See, we can only tell by what a person is doing, how he's living. And we have to make our assumptions based on that. That's where you, based on fellowship. The guy's living like the devil, he can't have fellowship. But you have to acknowledge the guy might be saved, but you can't be sure you're saved. Because how he's living. God looks on the heart and therefore him no works can avail. See how that no works can avail? Book of James, no works can avail. Such a simple thing. 
But the people I named, and there are many more, won't believe it. Oh, too many passages that look like works are involved. And they had to make sacrifices in the Old Testament. So therefore, that was works. They, that's what did them. That's what they had to do in order to be saved. And, you know, Noah built the ark. And he had to be saved by the ark. Oh, Noah was a saved man who built the ark. In order to save his family from physical death. But deny that. They deny every, everything about the grace of God. Because they just want to keep the grace of God in one particular dispensation and ignore every other every other dispensation. God looks on the heart, and therefore him uh, before him no works can avail. Before God, man must be justified by faith alone. In every dispensation, people, anybody tells you otherwise is lying. Is a lie to you. Is a heretic. Therefore, James clearly asserts to be true as illustrated in the case of Abraham, James 2.23. And this is, oh, I mean, uh, the dispensationalists, they didn't teach that. We were teaching this issue back in Schofield Notes, back in 1909, that James 2 was written, dealing justification before men. That is what Schofield wrote, Chafer wrote, uh, Rye wrote, and everybody, uh, dispensationalists knows that. Except these liars, who think they're the real Bible believers. Outward evidence of an inward fact. The first epistle of John is full of references to the outward evidence of the inward fact of a newly imparted divine life. This little book, and you see, first John is not dealing with getting salvation. First John is dealing with fellowship. And there are people who use first John like as a gospel. This little book standing near the end of the Bible may be taken in one sense as an examination of the believer. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. There is no reference here to the commandments of Moses. Every time these guys see the word commandment, and I'll go to like Revelation, see commandments. Tribulational saints have to keep the commandments. They, or they, they believe Jesus and they keep the commandments. We're supposed to keep commandments too. These aren't the Ten Commandments. What are the commandments? How are they summed up? Loving God, loving thy neighbor, as thyself. There you go. There you go. There's your two sum, summation of the, all the commandments. But every time these nuts, these heretics, the faith works group, they see the word commandments in any type of Old, uh, Old Testament setting or uh, New Testament in, in, in tribulation and revelation, see the word commandment. They have to keep the commandments. <laughs> we keep the commandments. That's part of our walk. We just keep it through the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit, you're, you're in a love situation. You're loving God and you're loving your neighbor. That's the fruit of the Spirit. In this, the children of God are manifest, manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever, whosoever do not, righteousness is not of God. Uh, compare John 6, 28, 29. Rather, uh, he that loveth not his brother. We know that we have, uh, so he's going to, quote many of the passages here uh, dealing with uh, that issue um, whosoever do, doeth not righteous not of God neither he that not loveth uh, that loveth not his brother hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit uh, that uh, which he uh, which he hath given us he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love and we have seen do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world See, the savior of the world Stop lying and crying that he didn't die for you. I don't believe he died for me. <laughs> Shut up, will you? Get out of here. We have seen, uh, we have seen the testament the Father sent the Son to be saved of the world. Whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, there's a confession. What's confession for? Fellowship. That's what the uh, eunuch did. He wanted to get baptized, and he said, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is, is, is the Son of God. He was a fellowship issue. Showing he was saved. It's not to be saved. It's not on to salvation. And it doesn't, it doesn't say there, see, they've taken this verse and taken it in, into Romans 9, uh, t uh, 10, and then saying 10, oh, see, it's, 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 it, it, you confess him because you're saved. That, that, that person is saved because you're saved. 
It says on to salvation. On to salvation. So the salvation here is a different salvation. It's a different salvation. It's a physical salvation for the Jew. They had to confess Christ to get out of Judaism. Or else they'd be destroyed by the common holocaust that the Romans were going to bring on them for killing that the God was not going to bring on but the Romans were going to bring on them for killing the Holocaust. They're, they're, they're Messiah. That's what Acts 2 is. Acts 2 is saved Jews in Acts 2. And they say, they don't say what must we do say, they say what must we do? They had to identify with the Christian church. And by doing so, they got kicked out of Judaism, which would save them physically from the coming Holocaust. If they stayed in Judaism, even though it was, they were saved, they would caught up in that and would have lost their lives. They were given, they were given a chance, that's what the gift of tongues is for, a 40 year probation to warn them to get out of Judaism. They want to stay out of Jerusalem. Get out of Jerusalem. Same thing happened when the Mormons came. They came in, they besieged Jerusalem. And then there was an issue where uh, 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 Titus uh, was called was called back. And I think I'm pretty sure it was the general, uh, uh, the head of the legion was Titus. He was called back because one of the emperors died, the emperor died. And so the siege was lifted. And so the Jews all thought they were safe now. And a lot of Christians got out of Jerusalem at that point. And the Romans came back. The Romans came back and over a million Jews were killed in Jerusalem. And that's what the Lord was warning them about, about Jerusalem. And he's doing, he's, he warned them about that in Luke. And he says, when you see these things, out, get out of Jerusalem. And there's this aspect, aspect in Luke where there's an a, there's a immediate historical issue uh, uh, the Lord is talking about and then a future prophetic issue that the, the Lord is talking about. So there's two issues going on there when the Lord is speaking about. Speaking about. One is that an immediate physical thing that's going to happen in 78 AD. And he warned them about that. He says, when you see these things, get out of Jerusalem. And they were held up. Basically, the, um, uh, the zealots kept them in. Uh, kept the people in, in, the, in the city. Once the Romans came back to the zealots, kept them in the city. And then a fire burned up all the food supply. Hall. Oh. <clears throat> Such a precious experience as described by, by these passages may become clouded by sin or loss and depression of some physical weakness. And were, and were we depending upon the experience as primary evidence, remember secondary, not primary, that we are saved, all grounds of assurance will be swept away. So it be that they may be clouded by sin. The more you sin, the more you lose your assurance. You begin to doubt your own salvation. That's one of the things you lose confidence in your own salvation. The more you go backward instead of going forward, sin now becomes a whole uh, a, a, a focal point. The flesh is now entangling you. In sin, and you're losing your vision, you're losing your sight on what uh, on the fact that you're a saved person, and you're beginning your mind is now going back to things you thought as an unsaved person. You're thinking because the whole idea is the renewal of our minds. We have to change our thinking as a Christian. Our, uh, we're changing our thought processes, our goals, our vision, our hopes, our dreams are changing with the word of God, the washing of the word. Now, when sin comes in, it goes backward. And your mind becomes corrupted again with the same garbage that you left. But you still stay man. You just got two natures. But again, if this were a primary thing, you'd be a problem. That's what the find and his followers are trying to make it primary. It's not. It's a secondary issue. In Second Peter, it talks about you can go, so go far back, you can blind the fact you were saved. So we'll be depending on experience as primary evidence that we are saved. All grounds of assurance will be swept away. The primary evidence is clearly stated in the same epistle as the final word of testing. Testing here given and the final grounds of confidence. So what's your final law of confidence? It isn't what you're involved in 
you find we're all confidence is if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. But this is the witness of God, which he has testified of the Son. He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. There's Romans 8, 16. The Holy Spirit. Give me a witness, a testimony. Now, because this is all personal, you don't know how other people are experiencing this. It's a very difficult thing because you're saying, well, do you understand the Holy Spirit is trying to reach you and, and get So it's very individualistic. It's very personal. And so people have a hard time relating to other people who are involved in sin issues and don't understand, say, well, what's the problem you have? Because their, their, own, their own volition is rejecting the word. And that's the problem. The witness is there. The Holy Spirit's witness is there. They've tasted salvation. They've tasted the idea. They've walked, began to walk. But they stumble. But the righteous man will fall seven times, but it still rise up. We have an advocate in, in heaven, First, uh, First John 2, who's advocating for us. But we got to believe that. We have to go to him in faith. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this is uh, and this is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath the life, and he that uh, that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things having uh, these things about having a uh, quote, uh, he has a parenthesis having, having life. Have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God? That you don't say believe. Didn't say call. Didn't say confess. Didn't say confess, didn't say call, didn't say plead, said believe, believe. I've written here on, on, onto you, to you, see, onto, to you, that believe on the name of, of the Son of God, that ye may know, that you may know. That's what faith is, being fully persuaded, that you may know. That ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Just the idea. So you look at that first first John 5, 9 through 13. First John 5 is talking about this is this is to give you confidence. Just look. You're gonna stumble, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna uh, uh, experience things that are gonna make you doubt and question. And if you view these things as being the primary issue, you you're gonna go backwards. And doubt your salvation. But if you recognize them as secondary issues and recognize the word as the primary, you can get back up quickly and keep moving. That's the issue. If you th you've got to recognize that everything else about doubt, you know, the the battle with the sin nature, uh, and you and you're producing fruit are secondary issues to the Christian confidence in the salvation. The ultimate confidence comes from what the Word of God says. Because the other things, the secondary things can fail. You know, people, when you jump out of a plane, you have two chutes. You have, a, you, know, a, you know, you have one you use and you know, the backup, which is probably not a good example because there's a primary and a secondary. But the point is, is that the issue is that this, the, the, the things that you see in your life, the things you experience, Experience is not the primary test of salvation. The word of God and what you believe is the primary test of salvation. That is a crucial point. Lordship salvations reverse that. Lordship salvation make your walk the primary test of your salvation when it is not because you can fail in your walk and fail so badly that even you would have forgotten you were saved until you get to until you get to the Word of God and you and the Word of God tells you, oh yeah, I believe that I did believe that I am saved. So that's what the issue of loss of salvation. They make what what man sees the primary issue, 
And then they tell you that, well, if man can't see you producing this fruit, you must not be saved. But that's not the primary test of salvation. The word of God is. He says the Bible, use of the word assurance, we found in several passages. Let us draw near with a full, true heart and full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10, 22. This is the confidence that grows. This is the confidence that grows out of a repulse of faith and the faithfulness of God that he will fulfill every word he has spoken. And unto the riches of all, a full, a full assurance of understanding, Colossians 2, 2. This is the breath of comp, breath, 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 B R E A D. Th breath of uh, uh, of confidence that grows as one increasingly enters into the vastness of God's revelation of His grace in Jesus Christ. So we say breath, breath. I'm pronouncing it correctly. How how broad the issue of of, uh, of uh, confidence it grows and it becomes your source of stability. You become very stable because you're you're fully assured that you're saved. Because you can't you can't you don't doubt God's word. Not by what you see, not by what you're doing, experience at that particular moment. By what God says in his word. And what he told you to believe in, you believed it. Some are so limited in spiritual vision when they believe that their first step in faith, uh, that their first step in faith is centered on one promise alone. To such, to such there will be a grow, growing understanding and a cause, corresponding increase in confidence and assurance as other promises and facts of grace are apprehended. So, when you first believe, now you, you, you've claimed the promise of, the, of salvation. And other promises now will, will start to come in. Other promises that are part of your walk. And that will increase your stability in trusting in the word of God. Because now you see as, as you read the word of God and, he, and, he, and, and the word of God uh, 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 cleanses you. And changes you and transforms your mind. You now have a, and, and you see the vastness of God's grace. You have more confidence in God's grace. And that gives you a greater stability. And that's what the Christian needs. And it's walking out James. You can't be unstable. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't fight if you're unstable. That's the first principle of combat. Any combat. You have to have balance. All combat is based on balance. So you see a man who's on uh, the whole the purpose of, of, of uh, when you're fighting, get the other guy off balance. He becomes helpless. So in your, in your spiritual warfare, your feet have to be planted solid in a, in a solid uh, uh, basis in order to fight. If you're, if you're uh, double-minded, you're unstable. You're going back and forth, back and forth. You're always off balance. Combat, you have to have your feet planted correctly in order to get balance for both defensive and offensive action. To such there will be growing confidence, and, and we desire that every one of, uh, of you do show the same diligence of the full assurance of hope unto the end, Hebrews 6.11. Here's a reference that assurance, which is a full conviction, that every promise and revelation concerning the future will surely be fulfilled. This, like all assurances, are simply, are simply the result of believing God. So, that's what assurance of salvation is about. It's different from eternal security because eternal security develops more as you grow and understand that it's a, it's, it's a, a permanent issue no matter what happens. Assurance is that moment, present issue. Are you sure? Can you be sure that at that moment you're going to go to heaven? Despite what spiritual condition you're in. Eternal security is how you get to that point where 
your assurances get deeper and stronger and uh, uh, there's a greater appreciation of uh, understanding what God does in order to, uh, or has done to keep you secure, eternal secure, eternal, uh, an, an eternal secure position. So eternal security becomes an issue of study and, and growth, understanding and appreciating eternal security. But assurance is something you should have at the, at the point of salvation. And that's why it's part of the immediate walk. So you can have full confidence at that moment because you believe in the gospel. You believe in the true gospel and are saved. And that's your assurance. And your assurance does not come. And this is the crucial point here. The assurance does not come from your emotions. It doesn't come from what you're doing. Although you should be doing God's things, what God wants you to do. You should be bearing fruit, but that's not where the basis of your, your assurance comes from. Because that is basically to change. You might not be doing what God wants you to do because of free will. You choose to yield to the Holy Spirit or not. But we don't make that the primary uh, 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 criteria of salvation. The Lordship of salvation is still, but we don't. Those who believe in eternal security, we make that a secondary issue. Although it's there, we know a battle has to exist in the, and that's what uh, Hebrews is talking about, uh, if the Lord doesn't chasten you, in Hebrews 12. That's one of the proofs that God isn't chastening you when you're out of fellowship. You, know, you better check your salvation, but you might be safe. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, no, if he doesn't, if, if I say if he isn't chasing you, you aren't safe. You 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 aren't safe. But the fact is, you might be a point where you've gotten so hard in that you become indifferent to the chas chasing chastening. But you're supposed to check it. So the chastening is an added addition to show that you're getting something that unbelievers don't even get, an additional. And if and and if you aren't. <coughs> And if, the, and if the if you're not getting chastened by God, that's what he was twelve. So then you won't, you're not saved. Then you then you have to go back and check what you believed if you believe the true gospel or not. Not the issue of your faith, but the issue of the objective faith. Were there works added to it? That's what you're checking on now. So that's one of the other proofs in Hebrews twelve. They say, well, you know. Uh, there's an added chastisement that not only you're suffering the things that normally happen to unbelievers in a, in a sin state, but something else going on internally to you like God is dealing with you. And that's a chastisement. And that's to tell you, well, if, that, if that's not occurring, yeah, you're not saved. You're not saved. you got to go, you better check the, the issue of uh, why you're not being chastised. So that chastisement is a, is a blessing to get your attention and get you right with God. And to show, well, the issue isn't your salvation. You're saved. This is, where the, this is where the chastisement is coming from. But you need to get clean up your walk. So the issue is, the, the walk is not primary. Again, these guys reverse everything. The walk is not the primary identification or the way we check our salvation. The primary, primary way we check our salvation and have assurance of salvation is through the written word. We check the written word to see if we're saved. The 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 uh, the the walk will give off symptoms. Will give off issues or problems. Got a bird right out here. <laughs> and we'll discuss more about the walk, the Christian walk, the issue of progressive sanctification uh, later. But remember, the whole point of the issue of three tenses of, sal uh, of salvation uh, and sanctification is uh, it, 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 the past sanctification is done. It's over. You're sealed. And that's what eternal security is about. And then your walk begins. And the issue now is you're going to you're going to be going in and out of fellowship, in and out of fellowship. So your fellowship cannot be the primary basis of your confidence of salvation. 
It's the word of God that has to be your, your primary basis. Your walk is secondary. Now, for the world, outside world, it becomes our primary basis of, un, of believing you're saved, not saved. Because that's what we have to go on. It's what we see. It becomes, for the walk, it becomes our basis, our primary basis of what we see someone doing and living. And we say, well, it's very, it's very possible, either possible or likely that this person isn't saved and how he's living. But if you believe in eternal security, you always have an aspect to say, but we can't be sure. We can't be 100% sure. Because somewhere along the line, he might have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's in some type of backslidden aspect. When we look at Lot in the Old Testament, no one would have believed he's saved. If we weren't told that in Second Peter. We would never believe in a guy like Lot. And of course, Lot becomes an illustration of a New Testament belief who lives like the devil and gets to heaven at the judgment, judgment seat of Christ, has nothing to show for it. But he got there. He was a saved person. But from looking outside him, we never, say, we never believe Lot was saved from what he did. So the primary thing of looking at someone else, or the believer is the only thing we have to do is look at. We can only look at what they, how they live. But we can never be 100% sure in, 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 in saying this person can't be a Christian. He can't be saved. All we can say is he's likely not saved or he's probably not saved. But he might be saved. That's why you got to be very careful about denouncing people and saying this guy can't be saved. That guy can't be saved. You don't know. You don't know. None of us do. God knows. But when it comes to our own walk, it's reversed. The, the, the fruit bearing is, is secondary to proving, to showing to ourselves that we're saved. It's a secondary issue. And the inner, the inner working and, and the, the motivation that the Holy Spirit gives us, that's, that's, that's a second, secondary issue. The primary when these things, when those things start short circuiting because your own free will, because you reject the Holy Spirit, they still, those things start short circuiting and you start going backwards and reverting back to your sin nature. Then what we look at is the Word of God. And once we get settled and you look at the scripture, you look at the scripture, you look at the gospel and you say, no, I believe that. I know I'm saved. So now you can go look at something else and look at what what you, the, the, it becomes another issue becomes an issue of the walk. All these churches want to bring you back to the salvation issue. Oh, if you're fornicating, you must not be saved. Oh, if you're taking drugs, you must not be saved. Oh, if you're not alcohol, you 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 you're drunk or drunk, you you must not be saved. If you're involved in certain uh, the more the, uh, the the depravity sins, sexual sins, you must not be saved. You can't be saved. You must deny what the Word of God says. Because everyone's got a sin nature. Everyone's got a sin nature. So what you see these guys involved in, well, if he was really saved, he wouldn't be doing such and such. If he was really saved, he wouldn't be doing such and such. No. He could do it. He can do it. Now, The fact is that he's doing it, depraved things or sinful things. You have to separate them from him. Separate from him. You try to help him as much as you can. You try, but once, you know, he's gonna, you can't be dragged down by him. But you have to separate him. Separate from that. If he's involved in a lifestyle type of thing, saying that even if he might, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm doing this, this, this. Well, <laughs> you might be a Christian, but that's not how Christians operate in testimony. But the point is, you might be a Christian if you believe in eternal security. If you're Armenian, you believe, well, he could have been saved, but he lost it. If you're a Calvinist, you believe, well, he was never saved in the first place. Those who believe in faith, believe in uh, uh, once saved, always saved, we believe, well, 
He could have had been saved. He could have been saved. He might be saved. And if he is saved, he's going to heaven. And he's going to get there a lot faster than he thought he was going to get there. That's right. <laughs> he's going to get there a lot faster than he, he you know, he, he, he thought he was going to get there. Because this is still on to death. So I'm going to stop here. And I hope uh, this helps with the issue of uh, assurance. And uh, getting stable. The first thing that comes up in the issue after you get saved is getting assurance of salvation. Blessed assurance. And along that your walk, developing an understanding of eternal security. That not only do you have assurance that you are saved at that moment, and at that any more at that particular moment, somebody asks you where you're going to heaven and hell, you say, I'm going to heaven. But eternal security gives the, the idea that not only can I believe I'm going to heaven, it doesn't matter what I do in the future to lose that fact, to change that fact, to alter that fact. So you go from assurance to understanding eternal security, which gives you a, a total confidence and unmovable un un assurance. Because of eternal security, understanding eternal security. But you initially start off with the fact of eternal assurance, knowing that that moment, because you believe in the gospel, the true gospel, you're assured of going to heaven. That's a promise that God has made. And as you grow in grace, the reality of eternal security, that, 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 that gives you more and more and more assurance that nothing can change that comes as part of your walk and your understanding more of the uh, of the doctrines and the, uh, of, of God the uh, the acts the attributes of God and the riches that we talk about riches of inheritance of what God has done for you uh, when you believed and that he won't take away gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And that's what eternal security is about. You have to learn that the 33, 33 things can't be taken away from you. You might have assurance that you have them, but then you have, then you have to learn that they can't be taken away from you even by God himself because of his own immutability. So, and when we look at the uh, Old Testament, you look at John 10. John 10 isn't been to ch church. That's Old Testament. Sheep. Now you have all the things that we have in the church age. A lot of things are different. But they had enough to be saved and to have eternal security. So we stop and put this up. Amen. Thank you.